Today, we're talking about the relationship between time, money, and happiness. We're here to help you maximize your experience points that you're getting out of life and out of your wealth and get off autopilot. Today, we're asking the question, would you trade places with Warren Buffett. Our mission here at the Retire with Purpose podcast is to help others gain clarity and purpose and elevate meaning in their daily lives through practical and proven financial strategies. Every single Friday, which is what you're joining us for right now, is our opportunity to cover a trending topic, an article that comes from our Weekend Reading for Retirees email series. We cover both elements of that mission. We cover the non-financial. We cover the financial. Today, we'll be focusing on the non-financial elements. If you'd like to get a link to this article, check it out in the show notes and get yourself signed up to receive that email. It's an invaluable resource. Our team goes out, we sift the internet for all of the articles that we want to put in front of you, four articles specifically every single Friday with summaries and takeaways all designed to give you the best content to help you make better decisions in life and finance as well. Not only will you receive those articles, but you'll receive webinar invitations, event invitations, white paper giveaways, book giveaways. Uh, even you'll also, as because you've signed up, our gift to you will be a copy, a digital copy of my Wall Street Journal bestselling book, Job Optional. And what I'm really excited about getting more people on this list is because you get the opportunity to give us questions. We keep mm -hmm. the content more relevant because of you. So prior to us bringing on a guest, because every other Monday we release a non uh, short form or a long form podcast with a world class guest. And we reach out to you prior to doing those interviews to see what types of questions you would like us to put in front of that guest. So get yourself signed up by just simply shooting us a text with the key letters WR to 866 482 9559. And please, please, don't forget to rate the podcast, review the podcast. I look at it every single day to see how we are doing. That lets us know how we're doing, and it allows us to get our message out there into the world. Now, let's get into the content. Marshall Johnson's here with me, hey, hey. and we are asking the question from the Long Run blog, would you trade places with Warren Buffett? So, Marshall, would you trade places with Warren? You know, it's tempting. The, it's tempting, but the quote here says, "Would you rather have zero dollars and be twenty years old, or have a hundred billion and age ninety, like Mr. Buffett?" You know, I'm sorry, I'd rather be broken twenty than have a hundred billion and age ninety, because of unless you could be like, what about being twenty year old Warren Buffett? Yeah, there you go. I'll take that. Let's do this. <laughs> I don't know though, right? He had to sacrifice. He still well, I would say you would live such a different life. Than Warren, I, oh, sure. I and let's it's not for us to judge you know how full of a life that he lived i mean Absolutely. i think he has a true passion for his work mm -hmm. i think you have more of a passion for your family right and in other elements of your life i mean i think you thought really diligently and, and plan your time very intentionally around what is going to deliver to you the highest degree of happiness and this isn't something, I think you just, it seems to come natural to you. I, I don't think it comes naturally to most people, but it kind of does at the same time. Sure. I mean, if you ask anybody that question, I think they're all going to have the same answer. Of course not. There's no amount of money that's going to make me want to fast forward to being 90. 90 years old. I don't care if you give me a hundred billion or a trillion dollars. It's not going to, well, maybe a trillion, you could Re, just you could buy yourself another hundred years, mm -hmm. but <laughs> again, I don't think anybody is going to choose that in in reality. And I think that shows us that just intuitively, there's something about the utility of money that tells us that it's not as valuable later in life, and that it's more than just money. That that money is, should be leveraged to deliver more meaning and happiness in our lives. Yeah, this article uh, kicks off with with a few diagrams that kind of lay out, you know, when you're in your 20s and your 30s, you've got an, you've got all the health, right? Your health is, is really high, but you have very few dollars and you've also got a lot of free time, right? You compare that to when you're 60 plus, you have a, you have a lot more resources, you have a lot more money, you've got a lot more free time if you're in retirement, but you don't have as much 
health. So yeah. really understanding the allocation between those resources over time is something that this article is trying to put out there into the world and try to understand how we can kind of change uh, change this dynamic a little bit to, to not have the regrets like some of the individuals that are in their 80s today. I think it's, it's hard for me to apply my own personal situation to this uh, timeline. I, I see, well, you have a lot of time, free time in your 30s. We got I got three kids. I, mm-hmm. no, I, I got a I got a business I'm trying to run. Right? I don't. <laughs> I think I they should have kept it like twenties. Maybe they yeah, should have kept maybe it twenties. As a teenager, or yeah. when I was in Your middle school, teens right? And 20s. <laughs> but yeah. but I, I get the and again I think as we look at all of this content, it should be about the philosophy of it. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of value here if we have an open mind and think about it from a philosophical perspective. That yeah, when we're younger, what should we be doing? Yeah, well, maybe we should be going, you know, on that trip across Europe and staying in hostels and going on hikes. You know, it doesn't cost a lot of money to do something sure. like that. And we have the time mm-hmm. to do it. And we have the energy and the health of vitality to do it. We get into those later years. We probably don't even want to do that. But mm-hmm. we don't have uh, the the same level of you know physical fitness or health you know, to actually put our bodies through that later in our lives. We want to put the emphasis where it should go that later in life, we should be focusing on creating experiences that take more money, that take more free time, the younger years, we should be focusing our time that maybe take less money, but uh, require more health and more physical activity. So at the end of the day, what's the article trying to tell us to do? I think it's just telling us to get off autopilot, mm-hmm. you know, get off the whole Western way of doing things, which is I work my tail off, yeah. I grind every single day, I save as much as I can and I invest as much as I can so that someday I'll be able to retire. <laughs> If you'd like to take the information that you've gleaned here to the next level, all you have to do is this. Click the link in the description and schedule a 15-minute phone consultation with an advisor on our team where you can get answers to your own unique questions and concerns. And, and what he points out here is uh, time alone doesn't do much for us if we don't put it to good use. He says we want experiences. For the sake of this art- article, we're going to create a metric we call experience points. Mm-hmm. And Casey, I love the idea of this. I mean, it's always fun to gamify anything. But if we think about life, returning to this game analogy, uh, we're going to rack up as many experience points as possible over our lifetime. Yeah, Love yeah. that. Here at Howard Bailey, we have a couple that uh, we've been working with for a number of years that have entered what we call our champions group. They've been true advocates for Howard Bailey, sharing our message with as many people as they possibly can, introducing them to us. And uh, he recently passed away. And uh, and Marshall and I had you know, went to the the viewing and you know it's kind of hard to talk about just because it's a bit of an emotional experience for yeah, us but nothing sure. nearly as emotional as it was for her uh, what really struck me with her was the first thing out of her mouth was how thankful Lucky, she was yeah. for the experience points that they were able to have together uh since the day he retired yeah. uh, at the same time. I mean, she says, you know, we, we wouldn't have been able to do that had we not met you. And you actually told us that we could retire and put together this plan, you know, and told us, you know, what are the things that we want to do in our lives and spend more time together and really put the emphasis where it belongs on the purpose. Uh, however, they could have done it sooner. You know, they could have mm-hmm. done it five years sooner. They could have had yeah. five more years of that type of life together and those experiences together. So as it applies to retirees, I, I think it, it applies as well. It's hard to get off of this track that you've been on for decades on end where you've just been focused on accumulating. Money, accumulation, but, growth. But yeah. The recognition has to happen at some point sooner than later of why you actually accumulated those dollars so that you can maximize those experience points. You can elevate the happiness that you're getting in your life. But it starts with defining that purpose so we can create that financial life plan to elevate that meaning and just getting off autopilot. Yeah. And I think, I think too here, Casey, the article is not trying to, um, you know, force this fire movement or this retire early financial independence thing that's that's caught fire. I mean, I think the financial independence part is really cool, but that retire early piece is is a thorn that's always been in our side because work 
can and should be of a large part of what drives us and can drive that purpose as well. Well, yeah, and you can, what are those individuals doing in that fire movement that are deep into it? You know, hardcore believers, they're living in their best years with nothing, right? Mm -hmm. They are sacrificing everything to save as much as they can for 10, 15 years so that they can live, uh, you know, in in a free place sooner in their lives. But there's no telling if we're actually going to make it to the end of that period of time. There's no saying you're actually going to make it 10 years or 15 years. And I think that can lead to a a significant level of disappointment if we're not careful. What stands out to me the most in this article is this focus or concept of of death. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was a point in the article where they point out the top five regrets of dying, the most common regrets shared by people near death. Uh, Number one, I wish I had had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected. Yeah, so uh, they're focusing on forging your own path and, and stuff that they didn't do, right? Number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Relax, maybe maybe take more time yeah. off during those working years. Number three, I'd, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Number four, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. Mm-hmm. And number five, I wish that I had let myself be happier. Ooh, stress, and, anxiety. And nearly all of these things, they could have been accomplished without money. None of those things uh, took wealth in order to accomplish. And one of the things that this brought me back to is I I just finished reading a a great book, uh, The Comfort Crisis, written by Michael Easter. Uh, Mm -hmm. It it was, it really has made a big impact in my life and the way that I live it. And a a good, one of the chapters in the book, he talks about the happiest places on earth. We Mm -hmm. often think about that as Disney, but (laughs) if you've been there, it's definitely definitely not not Disney. So (laughs) for about 17 minutes, it's the happiest. Place on Earth. <laughs> now, what actually is, they, they actually rate countries around the world on a happiness scale. So the number one happiest country on Earth, the happiest place on Earth, is a little country called Bhutan. Ooh. Okay? And Michael Easter, the author here, he you know tells about the story of visiting Bhutan and what it was like in Bhutan and having conversations with some of the leaders in Bhutan and why is it such a happy place? Why do people live such a long life there in Bhutan? Mm-hmm. It's one of the poorest countries on Earth, and yet wow. it's number one. One. And the, the research has come to show what really makes Bhutan unique in relation to other places like the United States is this focus on death. You're surrounded by death in Bhutan. It's in the, the artwork. It's in the culture. It's in the way they talk. They're not afraid to have conversations about death. Uh, one of the monks that he speaks to says us Westerners are ignorant. Not ignorant meaning that we're stupid. Uh, ignorant meaning that we don't recognize uh, the reality of our lives. Mortality. That they mm-hmm. come to an end. And if every day we recognize it could be our last, clearly we're going to pay more attention to what may be going on in the given day mm-hmm. that we have. We focus more intentionally on the way that we're spending our lives so that we're maximizing our experience points. Yeah, our experience points that would that lead to this, what he calls this net fulfillment equation. Um, part of that experience, right? We're, we're living, uh, fulfilling experiences to try and accumulate these experience points. But Casey, one of the biggest things that I loved about this article is he touched on something that I'd never heard before. He says, a bonus of having richer experiences in life is that you not only get to experience these experience points, but these experience points pay memory dividends. And Mm. that just hit home with me when I think about all the things that I do with my son and, and experiences that we have. And we're constantly, you know, your phone pops up, you know, this is what you were doing at this time last year or two years ago or five years ago. Uh, I love shooting those photos back to him back and forth, like as a message, like, Oh, remember when we did this? Oh, that was so cool. Those are those memory dividends that compound just like, like interest does in a 401k. And and also on another note, I think there's some risks that need to be pointed out in this article. Uh, Some things that aren't pointed out. And I think this, this is, it's great knowledge. There's great philosophy here. Mm -hmm. However, if taken incorrectly, it could be very dangerous at the same time. We look at a few of the different uh, charts. And again, if you want to link to the article, check out these charts, retirethepurpose.com, or just check it out the YouTube channel. Uh, you can see our net worth over time is going to go up, right? It goes up, maybe it plateaus around 70. And, mm-hmm. you know, we start spending some of those dollars. Uh, and then you have our health uh, you know, that's that's charted alongside of that. That's almost this inverted curve, yeah, right? Deteriorate. 
deteriorating. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it deteriorates over time. And then you have you know a, a more optimal curve. And this is that we have more gradual wealth accumulation and we hit our you know peak wealth you know, a little bit later in our lives, and then we spend it all. And it's um, bringing into the conversation, Bill Perkins, we've talked about it before in the podcast, but his concept of dying, dying with, with zero, zero. he was yeah. featured all over national media outlets for this book, Die with Zero. And I just take some issues with some of the things that are pointed out here. One, Die with Zero, I think there's an easy thing to point out there, which is it's hard to figure out exactly when you're going to die. Sure. And so it's hard to die with zero. And if you attempt to do that, you may end up in a place you didn't want to be in the first place. Alive with zero. Yes, exactly. <laughs> still it, still alive with zero. Well, and I, I think there's a problem with the way that the author is saying, well, it would be better if maybe we saved a little bit less and worked a little bit less in those early years. And because... I, there's something called the compound effect. Mm-hmm. You know, Marshall and I are big fans of Darren, Darren Hardy, Hardy mm-hmm. and, and his concept of the compound True. effect. True. You know, I, I don't know that you're going to reach this level of wealth if you don't put in the work and save more in those earlier years. That's all as a result of compounding. Mm-hmm. You talk about compounding experiences. There's also financial compounding. I mean, one, you're saving. So the compounding is happening over time. If you don't start saving sooner, then you're not going to hit. And maybe, continue to save, yeah. And you may not Mm -hmm. be able to hit the actual place where you want to retire. You can't just bet on, well, I'll make a whole bunch more money when I'm 40 and 50 and start saving then. You lost all the compound benefits of all the years before that, and you're not going to have the same level of of, uh, work experience points that are going Mm -hmm. to give you the compensation to make up for the wealth that you could have saved in those early years. So, again... It's a little bit of an equation, right? It might be a little bit different for, for different families with different lifestyles. But I, I love the conversation around money and wealth and happiness and how this all fits together. And it's it's uh, it's evolving. The science is evolving, like you talked about, the comfort crisis. I love that aspect of it. I love what he's talking about here, pushing, pushing our health uh, you know, focusing more on our health earlier in life rather than, you know, Mm. some people will say, as Bob, Laura pointed out on his podcast with us, he pointed out that, yeah, I'm going to start working out. Like, no, you're not. If if you're not already doing it before retirement, you're not going to essentially start living a new life or a new habit. Not to say that somebody couldn't do that, but build, start building these habits in, start building this healthier lifestyle in and experiencing a little bit more along the way. Some people won't like that I say this, but I, I believe you can have all those things. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that all these sacrifices necessarily need to be made. You know, sure, there's some sacrifices. Yeah. However, I mean, think about work. I mean, if you truly love your work, mm-hmm. then that is an area where you're gaining experience points. You're having a great time in your career and you're balancing that with spending great time with your family and and doing all of these things that you want to do in life. I believe that all of those things are possible, but in order to have that, you do have to get off of autopilot and you have to align your values. Ignore the rules of thumb. You know, you have to align your values, your purpose with your financial plan. And that's not what's often happening in the world of finance today. You know, the, the, as we're trained, you know, this has been something I had to learn. You know, this is what I messed up. I came out of college taught that it's all about maximizing getting a better return, maximizing return. your wealth, yeah. maximizing your return, gaining net worth. And the reality is it's a very empty place at the end of the day, all of the decisions you make about money, whether you're 20 years old or 75 years old, should be driven by your purpose, by your values, by your purpose. And then and only then should you be designing a financial plan that can ultimately elevate the meaning and happiness you have in life. 